speaker is uh, Shri Aravindan Neelakandanji. Um, he's the author of the recently launched best-selling book Hindutva, Origin, Evolution and Future. And he's also the co-author of the best-seller book Breaking India. Thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Essentially this, okay, now uh, talk is about evolution. Evolution as discovered by the process of evolution as discovered by Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. We have to understand that the concept of evolution has been there even before Darwin, in the West as well as in the East. For example, Darwin's own grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, was an evolutionist. But evolution was more in the area of speculation. It was more a kind of a fanciful imagination. Nobody could provide actually a particular process through which evolution was happening. And in 1831, Charles Darwin got into HMS Beagle as a naturalist, a kind of amateur naturalist. He had been a medical student and he dropped out. He had been a theological student, he dropped out. And this particular HMS Beagle, they wanted a naturalist without pay. No salary, you can be a naturalist. And you should also conduct Sunday Mosses for the sailors. So Darwin being a theology student and also a kind of an amateur naturalist, he got that job and he went. When he got into HMS Beagle, he was a believer. In 1836, HMS Beagle came back and when he was getting out, he was not a believer anymore. We have to understand that there is a concept called natural theology in the West. According to natural theology, God created the world like an engineer creates the world, the arch architecture, or a watchmaker, that would be a better example, a watchmaker creates a watch. So when you go through the mechanisms of the watch, you will understand that there has been a watchmaker. So the entire world Particularly the biological things, when you go into the biological thing, for example, you take a leaf and you see how the leaf works and you find chlorophyll and you see how beautifully the chlorophyll molecule has been constructed or you take hemoglobin, how beautifully the hemoglobin molecule has been constructed. You take the way the eye works, how beautifully it has been arranged. Then all this actually proclaim the greatness of the creator. And hence, why should you study biology? You would study biology or you would study physiology or anatomy to understand the, this particular grandeur of the creator that is there in this uh, life forms. Now, natural theology was the presiding doctrine and Charles Darwin went, he studied different flora and fauna. He studied particularly Darwin's finches. Now they are called Darwin's finches, the finches in Galapagos Island, how their beaks are adapted to the particular way in which they have been uh, taking their food. So he understood there is a kind of dynamic relation between the way modifications happen in organisms and the environment around. And that negated the concept of the watchmaker. There is no watchmaker or the watchmaker is blind. Later Richard Dawkins would write a book called Blind Watchmaker. So in 1836 he came and he was working on this particular idea. And he worked on it for more than almost 20 years. He was very hesitant to publish this particular book. At that time, Wallace, even who, Wallace who went to another one place and uh, he came back and he told, he was uh, arriving at the same uh, process. He was identifying this particular process that Darwin had identified and then Darwin realized that we should publish this and then he published it, The Origin of Species. And it became a really great bestseller. All the copies were sold and it created a storm. Because in a way, as Thomas Huxley put it to Darwin, Sir, you have killed the God. So, the God was eliminated. 
natural process was creating all these life forms. And what is this natural process that has been creating all these life forms? Darwin identified one particular important process called natural selection. Now, what does natural selection actually mean? Unfortunately, we have this particular concept called survival of the fittest. Those were not the words of Darwin. Those were, those were the words of Herbert Spencer. But Darwin later used that word. But when he told survival of the fittest, he didn't mean survival of the strongest or the physically strong species or the most violent species. Fittest here means that which adapts fast to the environment. That which adapts fast to the environment, that is the fittest and that will survive. Now, what Darwin identified was this process called natural selection. A philosopher called Daniel Dennett, he tells that this particular process is an algorithmic process. In the sense, it is an universal process. Wherever you have self-replicating units and wherever you have variations and then there will be evolution naturally. There will be a natural selection. And hence, it can happen. Not only in organisms in the earth, in carbon-based organisms, it can also happen in Andromeda galaxy. But silicon-based organisms, also it can happen. So, it is independent of the particular substance. This is a great discovery. It is a very important discovery. And many social theorists, including Karl Marx, wanted to co-opt this. One particular deviant form of Darwinian evolution is social Darwinism, which is a pseudoscience. And another one aspect is when uh, Karl Marx wanted to put Charles Darwin's natural selection into the Marxist framework, it didn't work out. So he said that uh, Charles Darwin was only an English aristocrat and so we should, we should not worry about natural selection and he rejected it. But what is the civilizational advantage that evolution brings us as an entire humanity and also as sentience that we have to look into? One thing is that it disabuses the human mind of the notion that humans are the top of the pyramid of creation. They are just a web of life and they are one of the branches of the phylogenetic tree establishes this very clearly. Second, there is an evolutionary scientist. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Sakhrutis and she is a Greek, so I have a problem with the pronunciation. She divides all the world religions into two. One is allopoetic religions and autopoetic religions, or we can say allopoetic civilizations, autopoetic civilizations. In allopoetic civilizations, what happens is that there is an external creator, the watchmaker. In autopoetic religions, what are autopoetic civilizations, what happen is that there are internal divinities. So, when Krishna says that he is the seed, there is a difference between the seed and the watch. For the watch, you have to have an external architect. For the seed, it will grow from within and it will expand. So, when Darwin proposed natural selection, what happened was a profound civilizational shift. There was a scientist called J.B.S. Haldane. He was a Marxist and he was also a polymath. He was an evolutionist, biochemist, physiologist, mathematician. And he made a very beautiful statement. He said that when actually Charles Darwin discovered natural selection, unknowingly he converted the entire West to Hinduism. Unknowingly he converted the entire West to Hinduism. His wife was also uh, Helen Haldane. His wife was also a biologist and she said that in the entire evolution you have Saivite and Vaishnavite components of evolution. The Vaishnavite component of evolution, it preserves whatever the evolution has created for a particular period of time. For example, there is a species and that species is adapted to that particular environment, then it is preserved. That preservation part of that particular process is the Vaishnavite component of evolution. Then there is always a mutation in the species or change in the environment and then there is destruction of the species or extinction of the species and new species come up. There is a destruction and regeneration that she told us the Saivite component of evolution. 
Now, what we have to understand here is that evolution destroys the difference between the different species. It destroys the difference between humans and non-human species. There is a continuity. Charles Darwin extended this also to plants. So he said that plants should be having some kind of rudimentary mind. He extended evolution to mind. And he said that plants should be having some kind of cognition, rudimentary cognition. And he was searching for it. And he thought, very interestingly, that the root tips, they behave like neurons. And he wanted to show how plants respond to the different stimuli. He couldn't do that in his lifetime. And his son Francis Darwin was actually a biologist. And he, when Jagadish Chandra Bose was a student in England, Francis Darwin was one of his teachers. Later, when Jagadish Chandra Bose demonstrated the electric responses of the plants to different stimuli, the physiologists there were not able to understand it because they were not having a Darwinian framework. And remember, the Darwinian framework is also very close to an Advaitic framework. And if you look at Indian knowledge systems, the six darshanas, the Sangya darshana forms the basis also for yoga and Vedanta. And it is essentially an evolutionary darshana. And that is the reason why in India we have never had problem with the evolution. If you go through a particular movie called Inherit the Wind, you will see the kind of tension that was there in teaching evolution. Evolution was not allowed to be taught in many of the schools in United States. Even now I think there are restrictions or you have to also teach some nonsense called intelligent design. So, these are the different aspects that one thing that we have to understand is that evolution confers upon us a civilizational advantage in understanding science. And it also makes us humble before the nature. And thus it gives us an ecological understanding. If you look at all important ecological scientists who came up, for example, Rachel Carson, they were all evolutionists. Jane Goodall, who actually understood the, the, the very... Um, intelligent nature of chimpanzees and found out that they were able to make tools. She was an evolutionist. She is, she is a Darwinian evolutionist. So this Darwinian evolution actually promotes a value of uh, compassion. And it can, it also is important, the natural selection is important for all the disciplines that we have, whether it is aesthetics, literature, religion, you should have a Darwinian understanding of everything from literature to economics. There should be a Darwinian understanding. For example, um, you have, we are going to have a talk about uh, building technologies. A Quaker missionary came to India and became a Gandhi, follower of Gandhi. His name was Laurie Baker. He discovered that India has a lot of variety of building technologies that were based on the particular raw materials available, uh, particular raw materials available in those particular locations and very suitable for those areas. So, Laurie Baker understood this. There is a technological diversity in construction technology diversity in India that is adapted to a particular environment. And though that particular technology that is adapted to that environment based on the raw materials and the climate gets naturally selected in that particular region. When you impose a monoculture like concrete, then it actually destroys the livelihood. So if you have a Darwinian understanding of this kind of social issues also, it will be very useful. Now said all this, we come to the recommendations part. One aspect is that Evolution should be taught not as part of biology curriculum. It should be there in the biology curriculum also. There should be a separate subject. It should be a separate subject. Evolution. Starting from the primary schools, the child should be made aware that the environment around him or her is not static. It is dynamic. It is evolving. Understanding this will be very useful for the child to understand the concepts of ecology. February 12 is the Darwin's Day. It is celebrated all over the world by people, evolutionists. 
India can be the first nation which the heads of the state wish people and scientists on Darwin's day. Because Darwin is, whenever we tell genius, we always think of Albert Einstein. Actually, Darwin should be equated with Albert Einstein with regard to the discovery of evolution. And thirdly, a person who actually validated Charles Darwin ahead of his time was J.C. Bose. It was on May 13, if my memory serves right, May 13, 1901, Jagadish Chandra Bose demonstrated the responses of plants in the Linnaean Society, which was the same society where Charles Darwin also presented his paper on origin of species. So that particular day should be celebrated by the Indian government as Bose Day when we transcended the barriers that differentiate us between plants and animals and even inanimate objects, even inanimate objects. So this is a great validation of Indic wisdom by modern science. And it is also a civilizational advantage. We should not squander it. Thank you so much.